I'm in Waterworld. That's a, <laughs> that's a good watery start to a very watery episode. Yeah. Nice. I can't believe that this is happening i am uh yeah i feel i'm having a slightly out of body experience and it's partly because of who our guests are today and also partly because the gummies rock <laughs> and i'm kind of like it's just spreading throughout my body now because we ate one on pod mm -hmm. um holy smokes like philippe and ashlyn Cousteau on weed and grub wow wow yeah, I feel weightless, like I'm underwater right now. Nice. Truly. Cool. It's awesome. Like the inside of my body, my bones, yep. floating so nice. Your floaty bones? My floaty bones. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me think of, have you ever seen a cuttlefish bone? Uh, uh, Only on like cooking shows, never in body. Well, you know, like when, I feel like everyone in the 80s had budgies and budgie cages, and the cuttlefish bone was something that people would hang in the budgie cage for budgies to sharpen their beaks on, which is so weird. It is a budgie like a bird? A budgie's a little bird. Okay. Yeah, they're like those little brightly colored birds. And I think maybe before people really decided that it was like not so cool to keep birds in cages, everyone had budgies in cages and they would sharpen their beaks on cuttlefish bones. And that's the coolest thing to touch one because it's just one single bone. It looks kind of like a, a used piece of soap and they're just like, they weigh nothing. Wow. It's so cool. Wow. Fish bones, man. Fish bones and uh, what, are, what are mine? Floaty bones? Floaty bones. Fish <laughs> bones and floaty bones. <laughs> well, what up, Mary Jane? How's it going, Mike? Amazing. <laughs> Welcome to Weed and Grub, everyone. This is a podcast about comedy. Cannabis. Cooking. Culture. Calling shit out. And conservation. Yo. Yes. Let's go. Marine conservation. This, I, I yeah, it, it was just like such an incredible interview. I'm so excited for people to listen. Um, and I don't know, we have we have some other things to catch up on first, though. We do. We have uh, some stuff to but talk also, about. I mean, can we do one more conservation moment? Yeah. The way that, um, like, it's always a family affair, but the family means people. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I think this is the time, especially with, like, lockdown open. Yes. And how the world had a break from us. Yes. So now conservation is equally, if not more important than ever before, because we gave nature a break, like we talked about during the interview. Uh -huh. But now, yo, we back and we need to uh, settle it down a bit. We do. I was just reading, you know, I woke up this morning and was scrolling through the news and boy, there was a piece in the New York Times about microplastics in the ocean and how those have, you know, basically now descended to the bottom layer of the ocean and it's affecting how our planet is cooling and warming. It's crazy. Oh like gosh. plastics have made their way into every sector of our lives. So that we really need to do something about that. We really need to address all the aspects of climate change right now. Like we are at that point where if we don't do something now, it's, you know, it's not going to be good. Yeah. And so it's, it's really... the gold finger problem. Right. What is that? Well, you know how we spray painted that? Oh, I love that you said right first. Thank you for your support. Uh, you know how uh, Goldfinger spray painted that person gold in the Bond movie and then their skin couldn't breathe and they died trapped in spray painted gold? I think that's an urban legend, but go on. I think it's in a movie. Okay. I mean, yeah, Goldfinger is. I've, I've seen the movie. I just don't know if that person actually did pass away. We'll have to look it up. But what's the Goldfinger problem? Oh, well, in the movie, they passed away. But in life, I think they survived. Oh, okay. I don't think there was anyone in that gold. I think you're saying the actor died. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. The actor playing the body. Right. What is the gold figure problem, Mike? Oh, microplastics at the bottom of the ocean. Your skin can't breathe. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? Got it. Yeah. Right. Yes. We are suffocating. Man, I'm suffocating. Sorry. No, it's that was okay. a long way to go for a reference from a movie that maybe a third of our audience has seen. Nobody's seen that movie. It was made in like <laughs> 1961 or something. What are you talking about? <laughs> Well, some people, maybe maybe uh, some of our friends who are yeah, over 40 listening have heard it, seen I, it. Seen it. I think so. Um, conservation. It's yes. more important than ever. I'm it sorry is. to interrupt your um, like information again with oh. things that I was just like, oh, that's a long way to go for a gold finger reference. Well, yeah. I, I mean, no, but it's it's totally apt. And I, I love that you always like, you know, want to like take that serious thing that I'm trying to talk about and make it interesting and funny so people will remember it so yes referring to the microplastics in the ocean as the gold finger problem that's i will remember that i'll probably use that as a soundbite you know what mike i'm going to incorporate that into my stand-up comedy act because hey. i'm doing comedy now yeah you are are we Ooh, getting I to our dates real quick i can't believe i just said that on the podcast it's a big deal i've done and it's two exciting. open mics it's so, so cool i've done two but yes real quick if you are going to be in sacramento on 420 Please come see our show. We have uh, Mike headlining, and then Ali Lou, Baldev Sandu, and I are all going to be uh, featuring slash opening for you. 
We've got uh, some great support from Mendocino Cannabis Shop. Check those guys out. They're they an rock. amazing organization that just launched. They've got incredible Mendocino cannabis, and they're delivering in Sacramento. And Lake Great. And shout out Lake Great always for supporting us. And um, yeah, it's just going to be really fun. And then you also have a bunch of dates. Go to Mike's link tree. Hit him up. Look at his, look at his mug. He's and come camping with us. Yeah. Oh, we're doing the comedy camp out as well. That's right. Yeah. Next weekend, uh, 15, 16, 17, I think, without looking at my phone or remembering exactly. In but Antelope Valley. Come hang out with us in the desert and uh honestly camping yeah i'm very excited to camp and like get off my screen for a second i'm so excited to camp and you know what i'm gonna bring with me i'm looking at this table of snacks that we have set up here right now the sumo snacks are going to be so phenomenal to have running around comedy camp out and just having like a bag of savory snacks that's 10 milligrams and you can make new friends. It's the most delicious thing in the world. If you're not make, if you're having, if you have trouble making new friends, just get a snack and share it. Yeah, that's really the easiest, best way to connect with a human being is through snacking. S snacking. So and hit up some sumo. You can get a free sample on their website at at uh, at sumo snacks yep. or sumo snacks dot com and make a new friend. Make a new friend. Snacks will help you make new friends. Also, weed. The great connector, right? Like, I feel like every friend I've made in LA has been over a joint at a party or, you know, some sort of like weed connection. And it's been so lovely. Man, I've gotten to talk with more people because they handed me some mm -hmm. weed to mm -hmm. sh smoke, which means like, oh, we can share this moment together. Oh, it's the best. It is. Um, or like, <laughs> what if we didn't know each other and I was holding some like ranch sumo snacks and you were holding a joint. We both looked at each other at the same time and we both like traded. How uh -huh. nice would that be? I feel like it would be like a lady in the tramp moment, you know? That's a good, <laughs> like new, uh, yeah, new like, lady in the yeah, tramp I'm reboot. Yeah, I'm snacking on the sumo snacks and you're, you're smoking the joint and then our eyes lock and we're like, oh my God, it's meant to be. <laughs> the smoke goes between the two people, like going yeah. like that in between them. How fun is that? Meant to be. <laughs> do you want to get uh, to the news oh yeah let's do the grub look is that real quick um our story this week is coming from a bunch of places it's on gentlemantoker.com and i also just wrote about it for high times and it's basically uh by the time this podcast episode airs the vote will have happened and we'll know more but uh there's a vote happening uh in dc tomorrow april 5th uh my birthday um to basically rescind the cannabis gifting economy so it's just so it's a really complex issue. And I actually reached out to some people to try and get quotes for it. And they couldn't do it because there was like not enough time to actually explain the whole issue. So I can't really unpack the whole thing right now. But basically, very quickly, Initiative 71 was passed by D.C. voters by an overwhelming majority. I think it's 68.7 percent of D.C. voters approved uh, legal adult use cannabis in 2014. That's a lot of people. Yeah, it's more than two thirds. And then immediately. So the district. Did you know that the district uh, residents don't have they have taxation without representation because they're not a state and they also their bu budget has to be approved by Congress. So even though D.C. voters voted to legalize recreational cannabis, Congress then immediately added a rider called the Harris rider to the bill, which basically stopped any retail stores from opening, which created the gray market that we have in D.C. right now where people, the gifting economy. So you go yeah. in and you buy a T-shirt and then you are gifted the cannabis. We experienced it. It was yeah. a beautiful way to do business. I mean, it's definitely a creative workaround, right? But it's not ideal. It's not ideal because it's basically set up tension between the medical cannabis dispensaries who are paying taxes and who are regulated and these gifting services who are not taxed and regulated. And so that like creates a lot of tension. And also it means that they, they're like these retail businesses that have popped up that are gifting and delivery services aren't protected. And so there is this vote tomorrow, basically, uh, to stop all of those gifting and delivery services from operating by fining them a crazy amount. I think it's $30,000 uh, for the first fine and closing the businesses down for 96 hours, basically for operating illegally in this gray market that was forced by Congress. So it's just this snake eating its tail of ridiculous fucking bureauc bureaucratic nonsense. So since this this will have dropped before we know what the outcome is going to be of this vote. Right. What what about, what can we say right now that like things can change on a dime and so to be nimble and quick? Like what's what what message is coming to mind for you in this moment without knowing what the known is? Right. So I think the message is uh, your work is never done. 
Um, you know, much like Philippe and Ashland, we're talking about um, conservation. Your work is also never done with cannabis policy because it will change depending on who's in power until it's actually written into law as a federal law, which, you know, is not coming anytime soon. Even though the MORE Act just passed in the House for the second time, it's not going to make it through the Senate. I'll, I don't know of any single person in the cannabis industry or And that's a McConnell is, thing, right? I mean, it's just a it's a it's it's actually even a bipartisan thing. It's not a priority for the Senate to vote on it. And, and McConnell has said that it was a poison pill and that he would refuse to let it pass. So the MORE Act, even though it passed in the House of Representatives to legalize cannabis, probably won't make it through the Senate. Um, but, you know, just at a state level or at a local level where you like California passed a legal cannabis law in, you know, which went into effect in 2018. But 68 percent of California residents still don't have access to a legal retail outlet because the counties that they were in um, decided to stay weed free, basically. And so, you know, no matter where you are, if you want access to legal cannabis, you have to continue to push lawmakers and policymakers and continue to show up at meetings and continue to make your voice heard, you know, by the city council. And just it's it's just kind of an ongoing process. We have a lot of work to it do. It feels like the cannabis flag should just be three ellipses or however it's pronounced. Like, right. it's just like, and it goes. <laughs> and we and it know. goes. Yeah, and yeah. it goes and it goes, you know? Yeah, it's definitely, it's... Um, Ellipses, but they're shaped like cannabis leaves, obviously, duh, duh, duh. But they're tiny. Yeah. And they look like three dots till you get up close. Great. I Art. love it. <laughs> so, Banksy, hit me up. I'm at Glazer Boo Hoo Hoo. I got you on this flag. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, make the flag, like, make a pin, make a t-shirt, wave it around. We're, we've got so much to do in cannabis policy and also in marine conservation. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Man, ugh, I can't believe it. Um, it's infuriating. I, I want to just... Plug it one more time, yeah. even though we're going to get to the interview. Seaweed Naturals, um, they have body oils, they have balms. Oh, right there, Mark. Yeah. Oh, Mark, we got to get to you in one second. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's my, I, You know how like um, my shoulder just doesn't want to be a shoulder anymore? Right. It feels great. Yeah. I feel loose. I feel nimble. I could like bench press again, which would feel amazing. I, you're looking very relaxed right now. It's yeah. good. You're looking, you're looking chill. Like you're looking fly. Yo, you're feeling good. I'm floating around the world. <laughs> <Your> floaty bones. <laughs> Mark. Yeah. So we, uh, yeah, we got to set you up, Mark, because when um, Philippe and Ashlyn were coming into the studio today, producer uh, Mark was like, uh, wait, who's coming in? And we we're like, uh, the Cousteaus. And it turns out that you have your own family connection to them. Yeah. So I actually grew up overseas in Egypt and um, my parents had lived there previously from 1978 to 84 when my brother was born. And so my parents were some of the earliest scuba divers for the, in the Red Sea. So my dad helped map um, some of the reefs. And so he dove a bit with Philippe's father. Wow. Way back in the day, because my dad was one of the few people that, you know, as, a, as an American, he brought back an air compressor to Cairo. And so he was one of the few people that could fill tanks. My dad would, I think the, the terminology, he would smelt iron to make the weights for scuba diving. Wow. And then, um, yeah. He helped so, create scuba. No, my dad did not help create scuba. My That's dad, what I'm hearing. <laughs> no, no, way before him. Yeah. But my dad was easily one of the people that had access to the equipment needed to do in that remote, that remote area. Because at that time, there was maybe like a few tents. There was like one tiny hotel. And like, you know, it, there was there was nothing in that area of what would be considered Sharm el Sheikh and, you know, the Ras Muhammad, you know, you know, underwater nature preserve. Wow. I mean, that was just so wild. And I, it's, it's sort of an unbelievable to have that connection. Like, you know, I saw you and Philippe just like chatting in the hallway and it was, yeah, it was just the coolest thing in the world. So for you, for, for your question about scuba, so Jacques Cousteau, we have this book on the table here. I was saying he was the Pope of the Sea, but the title of this book is actually better. It's The Sea King. Sea King. It's a great book about Jacques Cousteau by Brad Matson, And, um, you know, basically just describes the impact that Jacques Cousteau had on the planet with his marine conservation work because he invented, he was one of the one of the inventors of the aqua lung, which became scuba, which is the self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, which are the tanks that allow us to go that underwater Jethro and stay Tull underwater. Sang about. Right. <laughs> right? I have no idea. Aqua lung was a Jethro Tull song, I believe. Oh, okay. And he plays his flute. Mm-hmm. Yep, Ian Anderson. Shout out Ian Anderson. He's great on that flute. <laughs> so yeah, the I mean, you know, his impact on uh, the oceans can't be understated. And uh, 
his grandson, Philippe, is now carrying on the family tradition of marine conservation. And I also want to shout out uh, the documentary, The Silent World, because uh, that was something that Cousteau directed. Mm -hmm. And then he won the, please pronounce it better than me. Palm d'Or? Palm d'Or, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, oh, yeah. perfect. At, at, uh, do you say can or cons? Con. Con. At Maybe it's can. Do you know, Mark? It, 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 you it, know what? I It's one of those things where like I always hear is con. Right. I think it's, it's con. con. Yeah. Can. Is it New Orleans or New Orleans? New Orleans. Right. It's one thing with an apostrophe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But so, The Silent World yes. uh, won the Palm d'Or. Yes. And um, I have not seen it yet, but if I'm going to watch a nature documentary, it's going to be this one. Let's, let's go. Let's eat a seaweed gummy and watch that documentary. I would love that. Yeah. My skin's going to look good. Yeah. Oof, I am in. So, uh, yeah, it was like just the coolest moment to like have all of these things sort of tie together and then and then hang out with Philippe and Ashlyn and hear all of the cool stuff that they're doing. This is wild. Yeah. When we started this three years ago, mm -hmm. I was like, finally, an, ex an excuse to hang out, do business, get high, and eat. Yeah. And now, like, and now what you're the learning fuck, about man? nature, Mike. <laughs> See, it just took me three years. <laughs> what a long game. You know, I, th I d that brings me to a point. I went before we introduce or get to the interview. I, I do want to talk about something that I learned. Uh, I'm sure I was, you know, probably reading it in some boring outlet, but. Um, it was about uh, types of fun. Do you know about this? No. There's type one of fun and then type two of fun. Type one of type one fun is where you're just having a good time. Fun. Okay. You're having a great time. You're on a roller coaster. You're at the beach. You're hanging with friends. You're eating snacks and listening to good music. Type two fun is your kind of fun, Mike. It's where you're doing something that is uh, productive. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, you're like, huh. That was fun. Yes. I'm it's, an Aries type two. It's the definition of the mullet hang. Type two. You're a type two fun I'm guy. A type two fun guy. You know, you don't like the type one fun. You need to feel like you're getting something done all the time. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. sound like fun at all. It sounds like yeah. the opposite. Yeah. Mike Glazer, type two fun guy. Where do you fall? I'm a type one all the time. I'm a total fucking hedonist. Yeah. I never care about getting anything done. I mean, that's not true because I am actually productive because I do care about getting things done. But yeah. if I am invited to drop the hat and run away and do things, I will totally do that. You can divide fun from type two. Yes. Respect. Type one fun. <laughs> that's why Mark, this works. Where do you fall in line? I think I'm a type two fun, but that <laughs> might be the Aries thing. Oh, you're an Aries too? Yeah. What? Shit, we're all Aries? We're all Aries? No wonder this room is so sexy. God damn, y'all. Okay, yeah. okay. Shout out Top Tree Studio. Yeah, high above the Sunset Strip. Thank you, Top Tree, for having us. This has really become a really cool home. And I love the fact that we're in the blue room because it feels very marine. Like, the vibe is really nice. You know it. Awesome. Should we get to Buds of the Week? <laughs> Let's get to Buds of the Week. Um, Can I actually go first? Uh, yeah, I'd love you to go first. Because it's Aries season. We're all Aries in here. My Bud of the Week this week. Mary Jane, it's you. You hit me with that last week, and it was the best feeling in the world. This week, my boat of the week, Mary Jane Gibson, an incredible, talented, brilliant, creative, driven beast of a human being who can juggle a million plates while chainsaws are coming her way and keep them all in the air and execute at the highest fucking level I've ever seen in my life. Mary Jane, happy birthday. Everyone should follow you on social media, but you're not even on it. You're so fucking busy and driven. So sorry about that. There is no handle to give, but happy birthday. Thank you, Mike. That means an awful lot. Thank you. I'm really excited for this year. I'm really excited uh, about the promise that the year holds. I was really um, so happy to hear Ashlyn and Philippe say that, you know, they're optimistic about things in many ways, because I feel that way, too, even though things are really tricky in so many ways right now. And these past few years have been so hard on all of us. I still feel good. So thank you very much. I'm really excited about what's to come. Cool. Cool. Thanks. Best of luck following it. Uh, well, I, um, my butt of the week is the Northwest Straits Foundation. Which oh, you is, killed it. <laughs> you came in with a charity? It's the, or, no, it's not a charity. It's a marine nonprofit. It's a marine conservation nonprofit run uh, currently by Don Hunger, who's the executive director. And um, he worked very closely with my sister. And um, there is a scholarship in Caroline's name uh, at the Northwest Straits Foundation website. And I'll drop a link in the show notes that is basically to um, go to Young Women in the Marine Sciences. It's the Caroline Gibson Marine Scholarship Fund, I think is the name of it. Wow. And yeah. And it's just, they're, they're doing great work at the Northwest Straits Foundation. And uh, I know Don listens to the podcast. So hi, Don and Jenny. And um, yeah, follow them on Instagram. They're not super Instagrammy. They're more um, on the, you can go to their website, which is just Northwest Straits Foundation 
dot com. But let me just look them up here real quick. Of course, because I'm stoned, I just lost the. I, I feel like I stepped on it when you said the name at the very first time with a joke, and so yeah. I'm so glad that you're <laughs> pulling up all the information to do it clean. Because I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, no, not at all. I come on, we interrupt each other all the time. Floaty bones uh, at Northwest Streets Foundation is NW Streets. Oh God, I'm gonna have to spell this all out. Maybe I'll just put it in the show notes. Nobody's gonna follow it from listening to me. W N O F U C K. <laughs> God damn it. Anyway, but you can you know just look them up on Instagram, and then their um, website is nwstreetsfoundation.org. And oh my God, I just pulled it up, and it says that they've just awarded three Caroline Gibson Gibson scholarships. Take it away. I didn't even know this. Take it away. This just happened. This is so cool. Mike Sadler, Mary Margaret Stoll, and Sarah Gutzman have been awarded the first three Caroline Gibson scholarships. And uh, it, I'll just read a little from the site. It says, in honor of Caroline Gibson's enduring love and commitment to the Salish Sea, the Northwest Straits Foundation is pleased to award three scholarships, which support current college students pursuing applied academic studies in marine science, policy, education, and management of the Salish Sea. Wow, that is so cool in Caroline's memory right now on this app. Dope. Fucking dope. Follow them. They're doing great work and they're supporting people who are going to make a difference just like our guests. Fuck yeah, let's get to them. Let's do it. Do you want to hit the intro? I mean, you know, I think we've set them up pretty well. There's not much more to say other than that they they really are just doing the coolest stuff in the most innovative ways, I think, with such open hearts and the desire to truly educate and inform in the fun, as as Ashlyn was saying, like she really wants to bring that fun storytelling aspect. Yeah. It's kind of everything we love. Also, their fashion is sick. Yeah. I mean, come on. If There's... you're not watching our YouTube to see their products and see them chat, like, yeah. sick fashion. I don't know if they're Aries, but they are both very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to it. Without further ado, here is our interview with... Ashlyn and Philippe Cousteau. Welcome to Weed and Grub. Yay! Thanks, <laughs> thanks for, for having, having us. us. We're thrilled. <laughs> this just the buzz when you were coming into the studio today. We've been so excited to see you. Thank you for joining us, Ashlyn and Philippe Cousteau. Well, we're we're really happy to be here and, yeah. and grateful for the opportunity. Uh I mean, first off, we just have to start by saying that our producer, Mark, when you walked into the studio, had an immediate connection because he actually worked with your family. Uh, it's I was blown away, honestly. Like, it set the tone for this whole conversation. The fact that his father worked with my father back in the Red Sea and my grandfather back in the 70s. Like, <laughs> that's <laughs> not a lot of people can say that. So, you know, you wouldn't think that here we are in West Hollywood and you'd make that kind of a connection. So and that's excited. your favorite place to dive. And it is my favorite place yeah. to dive and just put a big smile on my face. The set, Red Sea is? Yeah. Why is that? You know, particularly the northern half of the Red Sea, I love because not only did my father and grandfather spend a lot of time diving there in the 19, boy, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, there's so much bad news, of course, about coral bleaching and coral collapse and the oceans are in trouble, da, da, da. But the northern half of the Red Sea up into the Gulf of Aqaba is how do I explain it easily? Like, like corals don't like it when the ocean temperatures get too warm. Just like anything, if it's too hot, it's it's uh it's not good for them. But corals in the northern Red Sea have evolved to adapt to warm water. So water temperatures that are killing corals elsewhere around the world because of climate change are not affecting corals in the northern Red Sea. So you dive there and it's the place is still spectacular. Whereas you go to the Great Barrier Reef or you go to the Caribbean and it's bleaching and it's dying, you go to the northern Red Sea and it's still thriving. And it's a, a window into what the ocean used to look like and what it, which can, is look what like. it, what it can look like again if we do our job right and, and help restore it. Yeah. That's the first bit of good news I've heard in a while. <laughs> That's why I love it so much, you exactly. know, because we are so surrounded by bad news. There are glimmers of hope out there and nature's, you know, as we'll talk about later, but nature's so resilient that yeah. uh, that there's so much that can be done. And, and so when you see a place that is still thriving, it's it warms your heart. Yeah. Shout out Jeff Goldblum. Nature finds a way. Yes. Jurassic Park. Nature finds a way. <laughs> Great movie. Yeah. <laughs> mm. We might not find a way, but nature yeah. will. So that's the other thing, too. And a lot totally. of people talk about conservation. It's like, you know, we are a very selfish species. So it's not just about saving polar bears and saving whales. It's about saving humans. And yeah. I think sometimes people forget that. Like, it, it truly is about saving the earth for all of us. So It's really wild to think because I have a... Um, an obnoxious ego. I'm just going to be straightforward. Like it's a little too healthy, you know? And so I, I feel I feel quite invincible a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, and I think 
that feels like it's across the human race, but really like the biggest, most powerful ego of all in a really good way is kind of like mother nature. Like it's going to win one way or another, huh? hundred percent. If anybody has ever been stuck on a boat in a bad storm or lived through any type of severe weather, yeah, nature nature does her thing. Nature's going to humble you uh, very quickly. Yeah. (laughs) Well, before we talk about the main reason why we connected, Seaweed Naturals, can we hear a little bit about your story and how the two of you connected and- Yeah. So it's, it's, um, I was, uh, as I like to say, I was in my first career. I've changed multiple times now, <laughs> but I was, I had my dream job. I was a correspondent for E! News. So I was covering the Oscars and interviewing celebrities and going to movie sets around the world. And um, I had been doing that job for about seven years and I started getting the seven year itch. And it was at the same time that I met this very handsome, fun, sweet man. Uh, I'll kill him. Who is he? Who is he? <laughs> <laughs> speech about the BP oil spill. And he walked in, our eyes locked, and literally that was it. We've been together ever since. Mm. And so when I started learning more about what Philippe does and um, saving the world, and I started doing my my journalist research on it, and I just started thinking, wow, you know, I always thought I was, you know, kind of hip and like woke, but really I had no idea what was happening in our ocean. And many people don't, and that's not their fault. Our ocean literacy in this country and in this world sucks. So I thought, well, how can I use my storytelling and my knowledge of pop culture and make saving the ocean fun and accessible and and make it hopeful? Because there's so much bad news out there. If we always harp on that, people just tune it out because they thought, oh, we're all screwed. Who cares? I might as well just do this the way I always do it. But if we can give people hope in things that they can tangibly do and tangibly see, then that's how we can really change the world. And Ashton has been such an amazing part of my life in the last, well, 12 years, almost 13 years now. Yeah. Because, you know, for a long time, and this is a great example is us being here today. Uh, You know, for a long time, of course, coming from a legacy that's focused on sustainability and conservation and very proud of my grandfather and my father and all of their work. Um, we tended to approach a lot of these issues in a, in a pretty earnest way. And Ashlyn has really been such a, a wonderful part of my journey and in challenging me to be less earnest and more fun. Think about how do we break down kind of the assumptions about the audiences that we need to be talking to and talk to broader audiences and in new and exciting ways and take risks. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember when I was trying to figure out like, how am I going to, how am I going to do this? How do I fit in? Right. When I got married and I'm like, oh, now, now I'm a Cousteau. What does that mean? <laughs> and I, I was sitting in a, in a car and I thought to myself, oh my God, the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau was the first reality show on television. Is that right? I mean, think about it, right? It was, you followed around Jacques and his son and the crew members on these epic adventures, and they would go see whales and dolphins and sharks and all these things. But you, the audience tuned in because it was amazing storytelling. And it also talked about the crew and they were in their little, in their little, you know, French man bikinis and smoking (laughs) cigarettes with these fabulous tans. And I'm like, oh my God, it could have been called Keeping Up with the Cousteaus. (laughs) Holy crap. Um, And that's really when I thought, okay, like we, we can do this and people care and people want to know stories about animals and and about the ocean, but they also want to know stories about people. Because people connect with people. And that's really when I thought, okay, I can do this. I can, I can bring my, you know, my, my skill set uh, to this relationship and partnership and, and really have it make sense and be authentic. And that made me really excited. I, it was required watching in my house when I was a kid. <laughs> so this, yeah, it was just it's such an exciting show. And, yeah. and the idea that, you know, we could have a window into that world you know, and one now that could actually be hopeful is so fascinating to me. So I'd love to hear more about, you mm. know, find, like, how do you how do you seek out the stories to tell that are hopeful about places like the Northern Red Sea or? Well, I think it, precisely because they're so scarce these days, mm-hmm. looking for stories when we do come across them and find them through, you know, a network of boards that we're on or institutions we're affiliated with or partnerships, friendships, you know, et cetera. Um, you know, you really grasp those stories because we are facing an unprecedented crisis in in the world. You know, my my family's been warning about it for three generations, and my grandfather invented scuba diving in in the nineteen you know late nineteen thirties, yeah. 
And, um, you know, it was one of those situations where, you know, prior to that, really prior to the World War II, we knew virtually nothing about the ocean. And it's hard for people, I think, today to grasp and get their head around that. Like seven, a little so over recent. 75 years like it's ago. So yeah. recent. A life, yes. One lifetime. Literally one lifetime. Yeah. There's like a lot of ocean on earth, right? <laughs> yeah. There's a little bit. There's a little. And, a little. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a little. And, and, uh, 70%. And there's, yeah, there's a lot of like, there's some stuff in it. And, 80% you know, of all species. <laughs> right? Exactly. So the fact that, you know, our grandparents or great grandparents as children, had no idea what dolphins and whales and coral reefs and sharks and all these things even looked like um, is is pretty amazing. Um, and in that short period of time, and let's say really post-World War II, so the last 60, 70 years, has been a period where we have gained this enormous amount of knowledge about the ocean and about its role on this planet as a driver of our climate and source of water and food and you know all these things that it does for us. But in that period of time, we've also learned that, uh-oh, like post-World War II has seen this enormous, dramatic decline in the health of the ocean, right? Just in the last, and in the planet, just in the last 40 years in our lifetime, we've lost half the world's biodiversity. Like half of the diversity of living stuff on this planet is gone. And we have little kids. We've got a little six, seven-month-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old. And I think to myself, like, what kind of, a, how dare we? Who gave us the right to degrade this world for them? They may not see wild elephants roaming in Africa. They may not see wild bees buzzing around our gardens. They may not see, you know, stable climate and healthy reefs and all of these things. And while they have intrinsic value on their own, all of those things are also important to regulating the systems from food and agriculture and, you know, our, our, our weather and all those things that keep us alive, as Ashton said earlier. So how dare we degrade the world for them? And, and, and so when we see these stories that are hopeful – that can give us hope and give hope to people that we work with or tell stories to um, through the books or TV shows, whatever we do, we really grasp those because um, we need hope because it's a, it's a sometimes feels like a pretty hopeless world out there. Yeah. Is there a time or moment that was like the first time you were in the ocean or you saw something or felt something that like connected you to either like the thing that your family has been a part of or for you, like that thing that like now the part of the family that you're a part of mm -hmm. where like, I don't know, like, oh, oh, a dolphin kissed you on the lips or like, do you know, like there's <laughs> like you hear those hopeful stories. Yes. Were there moments for you that come to mind that like touched you in a deep, soulful I way? Too. I've never had a dolphin kiss me on the lips, but that now has just risen to the top of my bucket list. That's a so great bucket list. It is. That, you know what? Out of all the people on the list. planet, I feel like you can make that happen. Yes. I'm this. I'm going to work on this. Yeah. I probably have to whisper? rub like sardines on my lips, which would be really gross. But, you know. Um. Uh, of course, it would have to be a wild dolphin because captain doesn't count. But um, <laughs> so, you know, I, um, I think for me, what really captivated me, I was 16 years old and I went on my first expedition to Papua New Guinea and I was out in the middle of, in the middle of nowhere in, in Milne Bay and southeastern Papua New Guinea. We were like days away on a research vessel from any civilization and um, as we would call it civilization. I mean, there were people that live out in these small little very remote villages and grass huts and, you know, you know, fish out of dugout canoes and, and, um, and we, they would come out in their canoes and we trade with them rice and flour in return for fresh food and fruit. And, um, and it felt like Indiana Jones. I mean, remember I'm here, I am 16 and we're, we're, we're diving all day and we're trading with these local communities. And then we're hiking up into the mountains because a few of the, the, the folks that work on the boat knew where there were these caves, I presume they're still there, filled with human skulls going that are centuries old. And whatever culture or religion or whatever was associated with that has been lost to history. And so you walk through the into these caves just with these human skulls everywhere. It's like a Hollywood movie set, but it's not. Wow. And... Um, carvings on the walls and you know and I, really being a kid of the 80s growing up with indiana jones i felt like indiana jones <laughs> and that was that experience really and you know we were doing research you know during the day and taking photographs doing all these things so there's a purpose for us being there but it was also this extraordinary adventure that we were on and i was like oh yeah i see why my father and grandfather love doing this work so much this is amazing mm -hmm. um so i i was I was bitten by the bug personally. Now, growing up with their stories, I always always wanted to follow in their footsteps somehow. But 
had that experience when I was 16, I think in, in Papua New Guinea was really, uh, and what was, just give them the anecdote about the shirt. That was Papua New Guinea, wasn't it? Which, the, what, 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 well, I'm going to, if I tell you, I'm going to like, the, which one? This is such a great There's, team. Yeah. The teamwork is fantastic. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes. Thank you for reminding me of that. Yes. Story time. So I remember, yes. See, this is why. This is why he brings me along. The better two thirds yeah. of the situation is sitting next to me. Thank goodness. So, uh, yeah, so I was, um, and, and definitely something that I, I talk about a lot. Um, I was up in the Highlands after we were, we were filming on, and, and, and diving um, on the, in, the, in Milne Bay. We went up to visit the Highlands for a little bit to visit with some tribes that had not really ever been exposed to Western people. And I was with some researchers. And, um, and I remember walking down a trail um, and they still hunt with bow and arrow and spears at the time, at least. I remember walking down a trail um, and there were several tribesmen returning from a hunt passing me and they had some birds and things that they'd hunted and they were wearing, you know, beaded necklaces and they have boar tusks in their noses and, you know, ceremony, you know, had feathers in their hair and, and grass skirts. I mean, literally barefoot and carrying bow and arrow and again, kind of right out of a Hollywood movie. Like super badass. Yeah. Like yeah. real, like, like total, wow. badass. total inland jungle tribes. And, um, um, but one, a uh, young man at the back of probably five or six, uh, of, of these men that were hunting barefoot grass skirt and a Lakers t-shirt on oh. that someone had given him clearly. Uh, yeah. and I was just like, wow, if the, the golden threads that unite us, and it just so happens I was born actually in Los Angeles. So oh, no I'm like kidding. the Lakers shirt here in the, the middle, middle of the of jungle of Papua New Guinea, um, was was a reminder that we're all connected. Yeah. That's incredible. Wow. That's really special. Like, it was it was amazing. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. And then you said you also had two. Yeah. Well, I have two. I'll keep my first one is is brief. Um and it was we were we had a show on the Travel Channel for three seasons where we dove all around the Caribbean. It was great. And on our off day one time, we don't we had not very many off days, but we had an off day and it happened to be in a marine protected area. So there was just beautiful fish and, and um, eagle rays. And it was called, literally the dive site is called the aquarium. And I'm sitting there and I feel, you know, when you're scuba diving, you, you, you could, it, underwater is actually a lot noisier than most people think. So it's kind of like noisy. You can hear ships, you can hear fish, you can hear coral, da, da, da. But I just felt like something was next to me. And I was like, huh. And I look over and there is this massive grouper. I mean, massive grouper. It was a Nassau grouper. So they're these big, giant groupers. And I remember Philippe had always told me a long time ago that groupers... Now, no one's supposed to touch wildlife. Let me say that. No one's supposed <laughs> to touch wildlife. <laughs> but my husband did tell me a long time ago that groupers like to be scratched under their chin. And I was like, huh. Now, groupers also have very big, scary teeth. And I... <laughs> but he just came up and stared at me right in my face. And I was like, huh. So I just put my hand out just to see what he would do. And he put his chin in my hand. And I was like, oh, oh. And so I gave him a little scratch. Sorry, again, don't touch wildlife, everyone. He did that little scratch. And then he started swimming away, but he kept looking back at me. And Philippe was watching this from a distance. And he's like, you're just freaking out because you're like, what is happening here? Because he was big. He was like, a, would you say he was 200, 100, 100 and change? No, I'd say he's 100 pounds, 150 yeah. pounds. Yeah. So like, he's big, big yeah. much bigger than a German like Shepherd. Like a great Dane of the sea. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that is exactly. And so I was like, gosh, I think he wants me to follow him because he kept looking back at me. So I started following him and he literally took me on a tour of his, of his reef or her reef, actually. I don't know if it was a boy or girl. And showed me how it had actually had like a cave in the middle of the reef and took me into his or her home where there were like lobster heads and like shells of things that it had taken back to eat. And it just like sat in there with me. And I was like, what is It was amazing. It would what like wait. Happening? When Ashton would get distracted and pause and look at something else, like the grouper would just wait. He would just wait for me. And or then she she'd like keep following and then the group would swim off and like turn around. Like it was. So I had fantastic. my, I didn't smooch said grouper, um, <laughs> but I did have the grouper take me on a tour of their reef. And that was just, I mean, and, and I had eaten, I was still eating a little bit of fish at that time. Uh, Philippe doesn't eat any seafood and never has. And I, after that day, I was like, okay, done. I'm done. Yeah. They're, they really do have feelings and personalities and. 
I just, so yeah, my little grouper friend. Yeah, I would say that the, then, then probably the other, the last story that for us is Marshall's, right? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Um, we went out and filmed a, a documentary special for Shark Week for Discovery a few years ago called Nuclear Sharks. Mm-hmm. And we went out to the Marshall Islands, which is which is the island chain way out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's about as far away from anything else as you can be. And we went out because we'd heard rumors that the reefs there, in a particular in a place called Bikini Atoll, were thriving and there were massive schools of sharks. And and that was really unexpected because in the uh during the Cold War, that's where the United States did all of our nuclear testing. So we detonated 23 nuclear bombs on this part of the world and, you know, uh, destroyed everything within Ugh. miles from this test site. And it was our largest hydrogen bomb ever, ever detonated called Castle Bravo. And when that went off, it was, I think, a seven mile destruction radius. And I mean, it didn't, it just vaporized everything, you know? A thousand and, times stronger than the bomb we dropped in Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Mm-hmm. Like, to give you an idea, exactly. a thousand <laughs> times stronger than that. Yeah. Like, even the scientists didn't know it was going to be that yeah. big. Um, and so it was, I mean, it just decimated the area, as you could imagine. And when we dove in the crater of the bomb itself, there's still nothing there. Um, there was what, like little amoeba fish that was trying to like suck on one of us, yeah. like attached to us. Um, but when we went out of the actual blast site and just walked a couple feet, I still get chills when I think of how absolutely beautiful it was. And it was only 60 years after we threw hell, fire and brimstone at this place in the form of a nuclear bomb. And 60 years later, it wasn't just, it hadn't just come back. Nature was thriving. And so it's that thing where as a conservationist, you know that nature can come back. Nature can restore. But it's not until you actually see it with your own eyes where you're like, oh, my gosh. And it was that still to this day, I think, was one of the most moving thing that I've ever seen in my life. And that is also what made me just double, triple, quadruple down on this mission to save our planet. Because it's true. If we give nature just a little break then we can save the world. And we even saw it during lockdown, right? COVID. I mean, all the stories around the world of That's like right. dolphins in Venice and, yeah. you know, all these amazing things. Fish and, and wolves and, and... The deer walking back into like communities and mm-hmm. sheep, you know, mountain sheep coming down into little towns. And, um, and, and nature is amazing. And that was, I think, for both of us, uh, one of our most impactful experiences. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. If we give her a little break, maybe... She'll just okay. a little that's it yeah, yeah just a little that's all she needs if we followed any of the recommendations that any <laughs> yeah. of the exactly yeah. climate yeah. change scientists 100%. are saying yeah 100 yeah. percent. well i think that brings us to seaweed naturals exactly which is this incredible line that is brand new mm-hmm. yes and smells so good my Thank house you. is like a haven right Thank now you. Frag- <laughs> the fragrance is a big part of of it for yes. us yes yeah um, we're we're three three weeks Three weeks post launch, right? And yeah. it's, we're so excited, but it's true. That's Philippe and I've always wanted to do something because we always talk about this. We always talk about businesses for good. And we always, in our speeches, and we talk to the UN, and when we talk to politicians, and da-da, we're always like, yes, business should be used for good. And, and we were like, we need to put our money where our mouth is. We need to show people that you can have a business that creates positive impact, that makes money, that's good for people and good for the planet. And we always, obviously being ocean people, we, we know about the restorative nature of seaweed and how important it is for our ocean and also how great it is for your body and for your skin. And, um, and then omega-3s, a lot of people take omega-3 pills in the form of fish or krill, but they don't realize that number one, that is horrible for the ocean. It's just devastating wild fish populations. And fish and krill don't make omega-3s. They get it from eating algae. So literally, if any of you out there, please, for the love of the ocean, if you take omega-3 pills, just take the vegan ones. Take the algae. You're literally cutting out the middle fish. Um, And so that's what we did. So we made sure that everything in here has um, seaweed extract from a restorative farm in Maine Mm -hmm. that's helping out-of-work fishermen uh, and women who normally uh, fish lobster, but because the ocean was warming because of climate change, they were going out, the, the lobster are migrating north. And so these people were out of jobs. So this company came in, taught people, taught these fisher people how to farm and guaranteed how much they were going to buy back from them at the end of the season, giving them truly sustainable jobs. 
And so, and it's also re uh, putting out oxygen back into the water. It's giving nurseries for fish. It's sequestering carbon. So it's helping fight climate change. Uh, and then we also did the vegan omega threes too, because we just wanted people to know that there are other options out there. Is the kelp farm is is it farmed sort of like out on racks, mm -hmm. out on out on water ropes? I think they do their ropes. They okay. do ropes. And they they I mean you plant it also I think just you know in the substrate in the bottom seeds of the kelp and it grow and kelp kelp can grow you know a foot a day. So Some grow species grow a foot That's a day. That's crazy. Um, Amazing. So while the Amazon is the lungs of our terrestrial planet mm -hmm. the ocean is really the lung of our yeah. planet and yeah. i think people get lost and everybody's all about let's plant trees and i'm like okay i love trees too but really trees take de you know almost a decade to get mature or more three decades to be mature kelp and mangroves and seagrass i mean they grow so quickly like that the ocean is truly our answer to the climate crisis it's really interesting to hear all of this because i uh, you know, there's so many cannabis companies that they plant trees as they farm and they want yep. to do sun grown, they want to do organic. But the idea of using the ocean, which regenerates this quickly to yep. create man, I'm fucking blown yeah. away. You <laughs> know what I mean? And, and <laughs> it was you. all it was Thank all just you. this idea. Like we were looking around, we were, as Ashlyn said, looking to yeah. do lifestyle, looking for to develop a brand, et cetera. And and over the last few years have really gotten into wellness and cannabis through a, our co founder and good friend of ours, Jill Velasco, who's been in the industry for several years. And we started thinking to ourselves, huh, like maybe there's a way. We started looking around also at the wellness space and started realizing, huh, all right. Yeah. It's not very sophisticated, like from an ingredient product perspective. Yeah. Um, we didn't actually, we don't know, we haven't been able to find any other wellness brands that utilize other active ingredients in their products, which is right. like standard course for the cosmetic space in general. Particularly yeah. seaweed is like in so many different cosmetics products. Most people probably have a product on their, you know, in their bathroom that has a seaweed extract in it because, as Ashwin said, they've all been clinically proven to have all these enormous benefits. And so we started thinking, huh, like here's an industry that's ripe for innovation, ripe for expansion and more sophisticated products. So why don't we take all these amazing active ingredients from the ocean and combine them with THC and CBD in our products and like all of a sudden – a power, you, you know, have it's like a, a totally new product, powerhouse, and a, yeah. and a total yeah. powerhouse product that's unlike anything that exists in the market today. So, you know, we have, t you know, I mean, it's a cannabis product. THC, CBD, our gummies are ten milligram, like delicious. We think delicious gummies. We spent yeah. a lot of time on formulating them, and they're beautiful. I don't know if you can open it. They're they're starfish <laughs> yeah. shape. Yeah. They're little starfish. Um, they're little starfish. <laughs> and so both um, of us take uh, gummies to sleep. Because um, the world is hard to close your eyes it is. to. It is. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I reasonably stopped biting my nails. Let's see if we can do this. Um, but the idea that these have melatonin in them yeah. as well is so smart, so exciting. That's They're... actually what, that's what got us into cannabis. That's what, got, that's what got me into cannabis was after our first child, I after I was done breastfeeding and my hormones were all over the place, I could not sleep. I couldn't sleep and I was a crazy person. And it was our friend Jill who gave me a nighttime gummy that had melatonin in it. You I to took push it. Them down. It was like the really best crazy. sleep I've ever had in my life. And and honestly, if this formula or this formula that's in your hand, that is almost the same formula that helped me sleep. And it's <laughs> I mean, when you don't sleep, you are a mess. Mm -hmm. Like humans need to sleep. Yes. And it's really hard to sleep these days. Falling asleep as the sun comes up is like one of my worst habits. Oh. And every time it happens, oh, that I'm gives like, me anxiety oh. thinking yeah, about it. Because you lose a day of yeah, your it's life. Not, yeah. You it's know not what I'm okay. saying? These are a Adorable. Thank by the you. Way. These are awesome, and they're As, easy to nibble if you only want. If like, you want a, like a one and, one and a half, half little microdose, take a leg. Take yeah. a leg. <laughs> and then, I like, take a leg. Yeah, they're, they're brilliant. I know we're recording another F after this. I apologize, but yo, <laughs> we gotta know. <laughs> I would be remiss right now if I didn't shout out someone who I know listens to the podcast, who's the executive director of the Northwest Straits Foundation. His name is Don Hunger, and he was my sister's boss. My sister was ex almost exclusively working on kelp reforestation in the Yay! Salish Sea. And so this is just so cool to see a product that is combining all of the things that my family loves. I, I'm here on the on the sort of like the cannabis aspect, but my sister that. was on the... Well, and in marine. each gummy, I should say, you're getting a third of your daily dose of vegan omega-3s. Yes. And so the whole, again, the whole idea was saying, yeah. and we know that omega-3s are brain boosting. They help mo mood. Yep. Um, they settle your mood. They are good for your, your bones and joints and like all of these benefits that we know also CBD and THC with the mood benefits and anxiety and depression. And so combining those two is yeah. such a powerful, powerful combination. And... 
Um, I also think they taste really good. The, but I was just going to say so that. freaking good. Yeah. They're really good. <laughs> and the, they're vegan. They're yeah, vegan. Well. And the vegan. sweetness yeah. level is so perfect. They yeah, we didn't very... want them too sweet. We didn't want them too sour. We just kind of wanted them, and we so, didn't yeah. want them to be too chewy. And So for the same price, like, why not? Our whole point was, like, listen, and we're eating any real price difference in the seaweed and the algae extracts because we want this to be accessible to people. And and for the same price, you can have a, just a better, more sophisticated product than anything that exists, we believe, on the market right now. And, and helps the ocean. And also, yeah. b- just by buying this, yeah. you're helping restore the ocean, put people to work, helping education because we give 5% back to education and communities here in Los Angeles and all about helping underserved communities, historically neglected communities here have access to mentorship and economic training and et cetera. And so into the blue economy you know, specifically, into, exactly. which is the economy around the ocean. So oh, we're, yeah. we're, you know, we were an in values based brand. That's where we started. Mm-hmm. And then we reverse engineered and figure out how do we create a product and how yeah. do we create packaging on that delivers on that, as opposed to creating something and being like, well, we need to do something good now. Yeah. Um, so we, we, as Ashton said, it's really about modeling how business and commerce needs to look if we're yeah. going to build a better hopeful world. Yeah. Um, and it just so happens we think making, you know, you, you also can't skimp. They have to be awesome products or else yep. people aren't going to buy them. Yeah. Right? They have to be a great product. They have to be great gummies. The bombs um, were really helpful for me in sports and any injuries. I had a long time shoulder injury. Helped I have one right now. Let's out. talk about our problems with our bodies. Yeah, right? Are falling like, apart, getting that. older. <laughs> um, okay, wait. Do this. Do, the, do this one. That's yeah. the one right that's now? The, yeah, that's the THC. Heavy. There's a THC heavy and a CBD heavy, oh, but go, go THC. Man. You put it on on air. Oh, it smells so good. I'm I know we worked hard <laughs> on the fragrance because I like we... to say it's like a a warm breeze, warm breeze coming off the Mediterranean. It really it's is because like it's lavender does... and lemon. Yeah. And, yeah, and it has almost like a salt air sort of briny mm-hmm. quality. I don't know how you got that I wanted, in there, but it's I wanted magic. dudes to be okay with it too. You mm-hmm. know, like. Yeah. Nobody wants to smell like Ben Gay, but not everybody wants to smell like uh, lavender either. Like, so I had to. So we worked <laughs> so really we worked hard, hard on, that. on the on the fragrance part of it too, yeah. and and um, and then of course tinctures. The CBD rich tincture is like my go to daily mm-hmm. because it doesn't like mess we have two you small up. Kids and you got kids to deal with. You got to work. You do all those kinds of things. Yeah, I just take the CBD tincture because it kind of makes me. If I'm like at an anxiety level like eight, it'll drop me like an a notch and a half mm-hmm. just Perfect. take the edge off yeah. so that like just smelling out just a little bit it's like but i can still focus i can still work i can still yeah. be on and then the thc t- uh tincture is is for fun we like mix oh, it I into a juice or something feels. like that and drink it in the afternoon <laughs> mike's um, buttering up his shoulder for anyone who's not watching and just listening why wouldn't you want to watch this <laughs> it's amazing You're on youtube oh YouTube. it feels so good and mm-hmm. it Man, I'm in heaven right now. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you it. both yeah, so we're, much. No, yeah. we're so excited. We just, we're so excited Yeah, about we just it. hope people love it as much as we do. And Was there a discussion, uh, like, how did you two approach the discussion of being like, what if we get into the weed world? Was that a, was that a <laughs> that weird was, That was a <laughs> very weird conversation <laughs> yes. that our friend who was in it, she's like, you guys should really think well, you about. you to tell them the story of the genesis of the world. Well, yeah. So Jill was always like, you guys need to get into cannabis. You need to get into cannabis. And again, Philippe runs a nonprofit that's about educating youth to save the planet. So we're like, I don't think we can do that. Yeah. Like, he educates kids. I don't think we can get into cannabis. Um, <laughs> but after, I think it was a, couple glasses of wine i'm pretty sure it was me no offense but because we can't remember <laughs> but we're like we're pretty, it was me i was like wouldn't it be funny if the Cousteaus had a, a cannabis line and we called it seaweed <laughs> <laughs> and then like we couldn't stop thinking about it and a couple days went by and we were like could we really no we can't do that well and then we just kind of started really thinking about it and seaweed- and started researching the market and yeah like, and we were like oh my god seaweednaturals.com was available we were like well that's a sign and you know and and we like, just we could, really we looked at all of our favorite products and started digging into ingredients and started mm-hmm. being like oh because ultimately if we can help build the demand for these kinds of restoratively farmed products and, and ingredients from the ocean that have all these benefits that Ashley mentioned the common climate change probably jobs yeah why wouldn't we want to do that yeah. And so, yes, it was controversial. I mean, look, my family was kind of like, what are you doing? Like, people like, cannabis. <laughs> my like, parents were like, that's you know. a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some press has been like, really? And, you know, and, and folks in the industry. But we really felt like, wow, this is a risk, you know, kind of worth taking. And, yeah. and, and, and that we want to be bold and innovative and, and, and challenge convention and think differently. And why not this industry that is like really – I mean, it's a baby industry. The, yeah. the potential for growth is yeah. enormous. The House just passed. It's going to happen, right? The pa- House just passed the bill. The Don't know if it'll pass the Senate or not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, but that's like, knocking on wood. It's, yep. 
it's going to happen. It'll happen. And right. so it's just a matter of time. Yeah. And like, wow, why can't we help to hopefully lead the way for it to be a, just a more conscious approach to creating great products yeah. for the consumers that also happens to just help, help the world. So how are you currently navigating the sort of like patchwork, uh, you know, states rights market with this line? Are you available? We're Focus just in California. California right okay. Just in California right now. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, we as soon we're, we're actually going out to raise more money next week. And as soon as we do that, then we're going to start looking at other states. But we just figured we live in California. We're here. The it's the biggest California, market, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's the biggest market. And and it's it, this is where we should start. It just felt and mm -hmm. the. I think, too, the whole thing that is exciting about this for us is the whole brand is so authentic. So that's we were like, well, we're living in California. So we have to you know, like, let's do California first. Totally. So that's why we did it. And I'm going to put it out there now on this pod. Uh, also, Discovery Plus, listen to this episode and give them a new reality show <laughs> where you get to like travel all over educating like supporting your own brands and um, you know streaming services. Like, let's go. What are we talking about? I here? honestly, I, like I agree. I agree because there's just so much that we can that we can learn from other people and other cultures and I, that. Uh, yes, cool dream, dream yes. show right there. Right, <laughs> we put it in the air. <laughs> Gotta put it in the air and in the sea. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love this. Yeah. Sorry, but like, thank I'm, you. This is awesome. Thank just you. Gonna be I, you know, up. it's. From again, we tested a lot of this stuff out for a long time. You know, we've been working on this for three years with our families and family friends and people with hip pain and, and joint pain and arthritis. You know, arthritis and and all these things. And all of them to the one were like, this is extraordinary. And of course, the topicals, they're not psychoactive. So, you know, THC has it's not just about getting high, it has so many, you know, benefits therapeutically. And so we have so many of our friends that use these, you know, use the topicals and then Sleep gummies and the date gummy is a lot of fun too, I will say. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the tinctures, I mean, the whole line was really designed to be, you know, what we need. We're, we're, we're developing other SKUs as well, more micro dosing approaches, some, some hybrid, um, you know, indica sativa kind of, kind of, uh, um, products. And, um, but yeah, we're really thrilled with, with kind of what we're doing and the momentum we're building and, and it's great. Did you notice an uptick in your popularity when you launched the line for all your friends who were like, Hey, <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Oh What's yeah, up? for sure. That's Much true. more people come over now. Yeah. And like, so what time are we supposed to come over? Cause we'll come over early now. Yeah. We're like, okay, okay. We got it. We understand you. Any more of those gummies? Yes. Absolutely. I want my omega threes. Sure you do. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. That's. All That's, use is medicinal, right? Yes, I, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But you know, if you could have, you could have your cake and eat it too, as we say. Why not? Yeah. Uh, well, where are you available right now in California? How can people find Seaweed Naturals? Uh, so we are, we can, we're on Grass Door for D to C. Like, so Through if you go website. to our website, uh, seaweednaturals.com, it'll show it anywhere. More or less, they have the whole state covered. So it, they will get it to you. Um, delivery you, at home. Yep. And then we're on, we're on the Same road. Same day usually. Same day yeah. delivery mm -hmm. usually, yep. And then on the road right now, opening up more dispensaries. So we have a Fountain of Wellbeing in, in North Hollywood. We have Golden State Greens down in San Diego. Uh, oh, there's one up in San Francisco that I just can't remember off the top of my head. Crap. Because it's all happening kind of quickly. And yeah. we've got a, a dozen more, more like that, are, that are like, yeah. that we're bringing online, hopefully. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so we're but really so focused excited. on like the wellness focused dispensaries yeah. that are really, you know, care about this story because, you know, um, um, again, the whole idea is, wow, we just, you know, from a wellness perspective for the bombs and the topicals and yeah. things that, you know, that help people, we've got a product that, that just is, we think, in a second or not. So I have a daydream to to of going to Catalina getting on one of those um, tours that they do with the glass bottom boats, taking a gummy, maybe Mike, you and I can do a day trip to Catalina, I'm Catalina listening, Island. I'm listening. And, um, and just like experience some, some seaweed while looking at seaweed. Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Yes, I please. Do and also, let us know when you're going to do that because that sounds amazing. <laughs> cool. Awesome. We have an awesome place. There's a cat named Bigfoot that we're very friendly with. Yes. Uh, okay. We got the in plug Avalon. in Catalina. Catalina. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Could, could we, can we take, we can grab like on the road and I do think like a... We yeah. can do like a little cruise. Yes. There we where, go. It, yes. You know, yeah, little, we just and we're gonna try and to adventure. befriend a buffalo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're so, on the other side of the mountain. Yeah, <laughs> I gotta be honest. I've never scuba dived before. Mm -hmm. It's kind of intimidating to me to be underwater at all. Um, can can you just talk for people like me who have a great respect for the ocean, mm -hmm. but also are nervous about being in it? Can you just talk about like 
what it's like to be down there a bit because yeah, I got to tell yeah. you, when we went on a boat in, oh, I can't say where it was because we were kind of sneaky No, about no, no. It. We went we to Tattoosh go- Island off the coast of uh, Washington okay. near Nia Bay. Yeah. And saw what kind of whale was Gray it? Gray whales. Gray whales. Oh, yeah. Freaking oh. breach yes. and go out and then splash and then learning that kelp is like, uh, what is it? Like to the core of the earth? How long is that stuff? Like, it's- <laughs> uh, I mean, kelp grows. I mean, you need sunlight. Yeah. So it can grow easily a hundred, you know, depths of about a hundred, hundred something feet. Yeah. It depends on the how clear the water is, whether it gets sunlight at the bottom. Um, so can anybody yeah. like can anybody enjoy underwater? Is really what I'm asking. Yes, because <laughs> I actually because uh, Philippe, you know, I feel like he was born with a scuba or a snorkel. Probably you were born with a snorkel in your mouth. <laughs> um, but for for me, I didn't learn to scuba dive until Philippe and I until Philippe and I met. um, And I know a lot of people are scared because they think that they're going to feel claustrophobic, Mm -hmm. but it is actually the total opposite of that. Once you get down there, you feel so free. I mean, you're flying. And if you do go and swim like in the kelp forest, you actually feel like you're flying through a forest because you're weightless. You can move, you can use your breath, your inhale and your exhale to control. If you go up or down, you could, I mean, it's, you're flying on earth and that, you know, and the species that you see are just things that you can't make up. I mean, literally James Cameron said like all of the things from Avatar are are from the ocean. Like they yeah. are He's all off ocean, ocean animals because mm-hmm. you yeah. can't, if you tried, you couldn't make up weirder shit than what's in the ocean. <laughs> like, right. I mean, there's see-through, there's like see-through animals, there's fish that have antifreeze in their body with that lives in the, like it's. There's, you can't make up this yeah, stuff. Vampire squid. There's Come on. Vamp- yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And cool, work, cool names. And yeah. I love it because, you know, like here we are sitting, we're stuck on the couch, right? And But if you're diving and you're sitting here or you're, you're in a space and you're just like, I want to go see what's up in that corner. You just like. You just go. Lift off. Oh, just yeah. Float up there yeah. and just go it's see. And, you know, and you amazing. explore this, this world in a 3D dimension that as terrestrial species, gravity prevents us from being able to do on land. And. You can just fly. I mean, you fly. It's amazing. And no one can reach you on your phone. Yeah, yeah. That's also really the other bonus. (laughs) Like you are. Phones don't work underwater. Thank goodness. Wow. You just made me think of like Barishnikov. Like anyone can be Barishnikov or Peter Pan. Absolutely. Underwater. Absolutely. You float with grace and just explore a whole new world. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's um, it's It's life changing. Yeah. And really nobody's hitting you up on Slack. <laughs> exactly. You are not worried about any of those things while you're down there exploring. Um, oh, I've yes. never heard a better, it's not even a pitch, it's just the truth. It's just like, liberating yeah. and free. It's, it's unbelievable. Like, grab some seaweed naturals. Well, that's it. It's very fly. kind of exactly. similar. You know, it's like, it's very, I think, in line with kind of the, the feeling and the ethos of like just this sense of freedom. And, oh, that's true. You know, this sense of liberation. You're right. That um, I think summarizes, you know, embodies the best of of the canvas space. And so, yeah. Plus, if you're not a scuba diver, you're missing out on 70% of the planet. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You Do you know? know what I did on my birthday? I went to Ikea. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you had some gummies for that experience. We will change it. Yeah. That, <laughs> like, ooh, that would give me anxiety just thinking about it. Um, you can only go stone. Yikes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. Can go. Yes. Uh. <laughs> uh, well, what an honor and a pleasure. This was the, you know, best episode for me. Of well, Wien thank Club. you. We've, we've, reached, we've reached our pinnacle with this Thank one. you so much. We're we so grateful. are so Truly. happy to be here. Thank yeah. you, guys. I mean, to, to have this all come together as we wrap up but having met mary jane and started this podcast and then like meeting your sister caroline and then hearing that your dad like and having you come from a history of like didn't you have like squid in your living room <laughs> i had dried squid as a snack when i was a kid oh no is, i grew up in fish? newfoundland so oh, yeah. ah, oh my sister had cuttlefish go. in a tank and they would ink when you walked by which was oh, that's awesome. they would? <laughs> yeah, she had to clean it out Every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, our dog poops a lot, so I guess that's Yeah, you know, I guess. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Oh, it's I love cuttlefish. Yeah, they're amazing. They're so awesome. They're the coolest. Octopus. That's like, I want to nibble on a gummy and like just watch an octopus. Uh, yeah. I, that's the only thing <laughs> I will awesome. never eat. I just. Yeah, you can't. I, yeah, they're so right? freaking smart. Can't what the that. heck? And there's a new yeah. PBS special out about them. I can't wait to watch oh. them. Oh, really? I haven't heard about this. They're oh, your favorite. Have you they touched an octopus before? Oh, yeah. What? So you know the movie My Octopus Teacher? Yes. Yeah. So I had a similar experience years and years ago, just in a week, where um, there was – I love octopus, always have. And I was diving in a place called Bonaire, and there was a little octopus hiding under rocks just off the pier. And I found it on my first day diving, and I went and visited it every single dive for that whole week. And over the course of a couple of days, from being afraid of me 
it started coming out of the rock and then would come up with his tentacles and like touch my face mask. And like, I put my finger out and it would wrap its, you know, tentacle around my finger and it would just kind of hang out. We'd hang out together. And if another diver would come by, he'd disappear back into his hole and that diver would go away and he'd stick his head out and he'd look around and then he'd kind of come out and sit with me. And, um, just in the course of, of, of like seven or eight days. And yeah, they are such extraordinary animals. Um, I just, they are honestly, if they like had opposable thumbs and were bigger, they would like be our overlords. Yeah. Well, if they lived longer than a year, yeah, yes, we would all be working the other for thing. them. Thank God they only live a year or two. Like I, yeah. Otherwise, they would rule this planet. One thousand percent, like smarter and like more amazing than us. I feel like it's what those Simpsons aliens are based on, which yeah. might be too yes. specific exactly. a reference. No, no, I think you're probably right. That is yeah. exactly. That yeah. is exactly what they uh -huh. are. Oh man, I hope Discovery Plus is listening because yep. this is a show. We've got some nuggets in here. Mm -hmm. We have a show. Yeah. Mary Jane, uh, happy birthday. Oh, thanks, Mike. Yeah. yeah. I don't I don't I mean just so this we This is all know, a happy like, birthday. This is, the, this is our birthday. episode dropping right now. This is an amazing way to birthday. celebrate. Thank you. This is oh, just about goodness. the coolest thing I could possibly do on my birthday. And I'm also thank enjoying you. your shirt. Oh, thank you. It's yes, prehistoric sharks. Yep. I have to wear it for today. So thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much for coming. This is just absolutely amazing. Please come back anytime to tell oh, yeah. us more stories you and got it. you know, talk about new products and initiatives that you're, you know putting in place to save Absolutely. our planet we will thank you it's amazing we're very yeah. excited um click every link in our show notes go yep. on uh at weed and grub on instagram are you on instagram with links. seaweed yep. naturals you are yep. yeah. great we're I, seaweed dot naturals on instagram great got it click 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 follow 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 there we go that's it thank you so much thank Ashley you and Philly. This thank is so you. fun thanks bye everyone bye